Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. Story time. I was camping with a mate on my parents' farm down on a river. We could hear noises. We assumed that my sister and her friends had walked down to F with us. I looked out of the tent and saw what appeared to be someone watching us next to the fire. They realized I saw them and then ran off into the scrub. I said to my friend, let's leave them here. So we got out of the tent and jumped on the quad bike to go up to the house, leaving them on the river without the satisfaction of scaring us. We left immediately. It's about two kilometers to the house. When we got there my sister and her friends were watching a movie and hadn't moved at all which was confirmed by everyone. They also couldn't have physically made it before us. To this day I have no idea who or what I saw and it horrifies me. This incident occurred along the Wise River in Montana. The actual address is 61 in 720 Montana Highway 43, Wise River, Montana 59 in 762. I lived alone and in this remote location, we don't have cable so the only option is satellite TV. It was a humid summer night in July 2015 at around 11.30 pm, and the TV was acting up so I needed to go out and readjust the satellite like usual. I took a flashlight and a gun with me. When I went outside it was unusually quiet. I also purchased an R due to other sightings I've had, but they weren't credible enough to chalk it up as a dogman. It was so silent it was unnerving. I brushed the thought off and went to the dish which is in the corner of my yard. I went to work, making sure all the wires were all right and pointing it to a different angle. Suddenly I heard a small snap of a stick to my left and turned the flashlight in the direction, and I saw a creature standing there. I got a good look at it for what seemed like an eternity, but was for only about 10 seconds. I slowly backed off and ran back to the house and locked all the doors and windows. The creature was unlike anything I had ever seen before. When I shone the light on it, the first thing I saw was the head. It has cropped ears that point upwards. Its snout was narrower than a bear's and longer and I could make out large teeth protruding from the jaw. Its eyes were a deep red shade that seemed to reflect off the light I was pointing at it. The body was muscular and huge. It had long arms that appeared to be longer than its legs. Broad shoulders that tapered into a skinnier waist. It was slightly crouched over when I saw it, with one hand wrapped around a small tree. I could make out the legs which looked similar to a dog's legs, they had obvious hocks. Even with a crouched position it was about my height which is 6 feet. Standing up to full height this creature could easily be 7-5 feet tall. The fur was black and thicker around the neck and chest, and the bottom half significantly less so. I don't know if it was aggressive or not. What I know is I had a feeling of dread, unlike anything I've ever experienced. Was it just observing me or stalking me? For a creature this large it was deceivingly silent. It got within 15 yards of me without me noticing. All I knew was I needed to get out of there and not find out. I don't live on the property anymore but after the event, I never had another face-to-face -face encounter. But I would hear sounds in the woods I couldn't explain. They would start off relatively quiet, and work their way up to furious howls or screams then back down to quiet again. I don't know if this was the same thing because it could be local wildlife. Back in the day when I was younger man, I was driving a truck down in Georgia, and I picked up a load of mulch. I'm going down this two-lane road and I don't remember the exact area. I remember looking at my atlas as I was driving, it was above Jacksonville, Florida, but on the Georgia side, and there was some kind of a national park there, with an Indian name Okfinoki National Wildlife Refuge. But as I was driving I saw what looked like, what I thought was, a bear or something getting ready to cross the road. I'd never seen anything like that because I'm from Ohio. I'd been staring at the ditch line because I was looking at like a planted forest. I'd never seen you know planted forest before. It was all pine trees symmetrically lined up and everything. So I see this bear start to come out across the ditch and cross the road. So I started covering my brake. I'm like oh my god I'm gonna hit a bear. And it turned and looked at me. Its face was flat, and it didn't have the big nose like like a bear does and I'm like whoa what the heck is that? 
It didn't look big and heavy like everybody describes it. It hunched over just like a Bigfoot, but it looked smaller like it had really long hair but not as bulky. The thing that ties into this dimensional thing for me is that I had this thought before I ever heard anybody talking about it. It looked at me in the truck, and then it turned its head and like a streak of lightning, it went back into the woods from where it came. All the trunks on the trees they didn't really have branches on the low levels, and so I'm looking at it, trying to look at it running through the woods, you know, to make sure I've seen what I saw, and it just vanished. It just vanished. These trees weren't full grown. They were maybe 6 to 8 inches in trunk diameter, and everything was in a perfect line. There's absolutely no way it could have hidden behind a tree. It just turns like a streak of lightning. I saw it running about 10 feet, and then it just vanished. So I'm pulling over on the side, rubbing my eyes like I've been on the road too long. But then, all these years later, I keep hearing everybody talking about the dimensional thing, and that it's perfect with, you know, never finding the body and all that kind of stuff. I love the outdoors and am kind of a loner, so I have several stories from times I was out adventuring alone. Lots of encounters with animals, but the most disturbing were run-ins with other people in places they shouldn't have been. One stands out as particularly alarming to me. I was driving up in the mountains in western Colorado, on a road that lead to a now deserted ghost town that was a bustling mining town in the late 1800s. On my map, the road ended at the ghost town, and I planned to hike a few miles into the woods and camp and hike around for a few days up there. High altitude rapidly changing weather conditions and no cell service. This was 2005. Driving up the steep road, my car began to overheat. I reached the town site as the engine temperature reached the critical point. I turned off the engine, popped the hood and determined that, while the car was not totally disabled, it would have to cool down for several hours before I could drive anywhere. My new plan was to let it cool down completely and hope that I could drive back to the nearest town that night without overheating again. It was all downhill, so I could probably roll for most of it if need be. I spent the next few hours walking around the town site, which was mostly just a grassy field. There were the remains of a few log cabins and stone foundations, a few mine entrances or piles of tailings, and what was left of the town graveyard, but not much else. As the sun dropped below the horizon and night began to fall, I heard a car driving up the road. It pulled up next to my broken car, stopped and shut off. I started walking toward it to see why another person would be driving up a dead-end road at nightfall, and perhaps ask if they had any tools or coolant I could bum from them. A guy got out of the car, a beat-up white Honda Civic. How he got it up that washboard mountain road, I'll never know. He was a few years older than me, grizzled looking with an unkempt beard, wearing tattered jeans and a dirty flannel shirt. He asked if I needed help, and I explained my situation. He was reserved, but not unfriendly, and told me that he was a miner from a small and probably illegal or unlicensed mine, who had been injured on the job and without health insurance had found himself homeless and living out of his car. He said he knew these woods and the ground beneath them like the back of his hand, and moved around from place to place setting up camp or sleeping in his car where he wouldn't be bothered. He said he knew of an abandoned mine site with an old, but intact cabin about a mile from where we had parked, and he was heading there to squat for a few days before he moved on. He asked if I wanted to check it out with him, and I agreed. I got my pack from my car, which contained along with the usual camping stuff, my 44 Magnum revolver. I usually keep it loaded when on adventures like this, but only have the six rounds in the cylinder with no spare ammo. I carry it for defense from animals, mostly, and holster it on my belt. When the guy saw it, his eyes went wide and he asked what I intended to do with the gun, and I explained it was just for self-defense from animals, nothing more. That seemed to satisfy him, and we explored the area around the car a bit. I stopped back at the car a few times to grab things I had forgotten, including a six-pack of beer, and one of those times I decided to take my revolver off of my belt and put it in my pack. I knew I felt something off, and was on my guard the entire time around him. I even made a note describing him and recording his license plate number in a notebook in my pack, in case I disappeared and someone needed to know what happened. These are the kinds of precautions I take when I want to undertake risky adventures. 
We hiked the short distance to the mine site, which was one old cabin, a dilapidated steel derrick above a vertical mine shaft, and a bunch of junk strewn about. After stashing my pack in the cabin, we walked over to the mine site. We climbed up on the derrick and sat on a small platform, and I shared my beers with him. He said this vertical mine shaft was about 700 feet deep, which he knew because the mine he had worked in had horizontal shafts that intersected this one, and we dropped our empty beer bottles down the shaft, listening for them to smash at the bottom, but they just disappeared into the blackness. We had some other bum fun, like rolling old tires down the pile of mine tailings, before going back to the cabin to set up for the night. The inside of the cabin was full of trash, but there was a cast iron stove in decent shape, and we lit a fire for warmth. He shared his food with me a tin of kippered herring and some crackers, and we set up beds on opposite sides of the small cabin. As we lay down to go to sleep, he asked me out of nowhere if I had brought my gun along. I felt a flash of uneasiness and told him that no, I had decided to leave the gun in the car when I went back to get the beer. In reality, I had most certainly brought it along, and had placed it under my pillow. We talked no more and I fell asleep. I woke up in the middle of the night and although it was nearly pitch black in the cabin, I could see that he was sitting up in his bed. I couldn't make out his face or even where he was looking, but I lay still and watched him for what felt like an hour. He never moved, and I eventually fell back asleep. We were awoken in the morning by someone knocking on the cabin door. He and I both looked at each other, wide-eyed, sure we were about to be confronted by whoever had title to the old cabin. After waiting for several minutes, we crept to the windows of the cabin and looked out. No one was there a bird of some kind had been pecking on the cabin walls, which sounded exactly like knocking. We packed up and went outside and he asked me to help him look around the woods for some stuff he had hidden a while back and wanted to retrieve. I helped for a little while, but we didn't find it and I was restless to try to get my car back down to the nearest town and start figuring out how to get home. We parted ways and I hiked out of the woods to my car, which started right up and I headed down the mountain. I got home late that night and started putting away my gear. I got to my revolver and out of habit, opened the cylinder to unload it now that I was home. It was empty. I thought and thought about everything I had done since the last time I had checked the gun. I know it was loaded when I put it under my pillow. I never unloaded it or even removed it from my pack between the cabin and my house. I went through everything in my pack, every pocket and gear bag. I went outside and looked through my entire car. There was not a round to be found. In the middle of the night, while I slept, the homeless man had found my revolver under my pillow, unloaded it, and returned it to where I had put it without waking me. He had a loaded gun inches from my head, and I never even knew it. I have no idea what his intentions were I like to think he was acting out of self-preservation, unsure if he could trust me not to murder him in the night. But then again he could have unloaded it so it would be useless if I needed it to defend myself from him. That was the closest I've ever come to being murdered in my sleep, and one of the scariest realizations of my life. I've since been much more careful to conceal my gun at all times. Epilogue. I actually ran into the homeless man again, years later, again in the woods, but about a hundred miles away from the cabin we had shared. He recognized me and I recognized him, but he acted very cagey and standoffish, so we talked for a few minutes and I continued on my way. He's probably still up there, if he hasn't died or been killed by the mountains. They can be very unforgiving. I was visiting rural Quebec St. Edgar, New Richmond over the holidays in December 2017. My boyfriend's mom and grandmother live there along with most of that side of his family, since his parents are long divorced. There was a lot of snow on the ground and more coming down every day and night. But on this night, there was very little snow coming down and it was easier to see at night. My boyfriend and I had taken his grandmother's car out to go drifting down a long road surrounded by forest, it's the same road everyone who is local to the area uses for racing. There's so little to do in this tiny town that people will actually get drunk and go racing down this winding road for fun, and friends and family will come to watch and cheer them on. There are a lot of car accidents in this area, and this area is also overflowing with wildlife. Deer, bear, moose, coyotes, wolves, rabbits, skunks, etc. It's a fantastic area for hunting when legal. 
So picture this. My boyfriend is driving us to his mother's house, and we've been drifting on purpose and laughing and obviously scared of what we were doing but having a great time. We're almost to the end of the road and because of the drifting, it's taken longer than usual to get home. Something swoops through the trees to our right, just above where the headlights are lighting up so we can't see all of it anymore. The thing is so large and heavy that the trees it touched are swaying all around. It had huge black wings that acted as a sort of blanket that covered and blacked out an already dark sky, and its shape was indistinguishable beyond that. The only thing I could think to describe its size was a moose with wings. Minus the four legs. Definitely not a moose, that's just to explain the size of the thing. My boyfriend almost swerved into the trees. He and I were really startled and panicked the whole rest of the drive home, and instead of drifting, we just drove straight home. He refuses to believe it was anything supernatural and decided it must have been the world's largest owl. I told him that if he ever finds an owl the size of a car he should rest assured it is not an owl. I hadn't thought about this until a couple of days ago when I was listening to a compilation of stories about skinwalkers, and it got me thinking if what my boyfriend and I saw was some sort of cryptid. The closest resembling cryptid is a mix of a mothman or jersey devil. I have no idea. Hopefully this is useful to you. With all the excitement of a teenager receiving their license paired with an equal lack of foresight, I often drove around my county and got lost while in high school. I knew most of the roads in my area, so I usually just took a few random turns until I inevitably found a street I recognized and found my way home. One weekend I found myself on a particularly long stretch of mountainous road in the middle of nowhere, even by the county standards. While I took the curves of the road with ease, I nervously eyed my gas gauge which told me my car was running on fumes. Predictably I found myself on the side of road, and I learned a lesson about the value of preparation. Without any cell signal I couldn't call for help, so I weighed my options. I could walk backwards to the last gas station, I saw over 10 miles ago or walk forward, and hope I found some semblance of civilization around the corner. I flipped a coin and decided to walk forward. The desolate road itself cut through a large pine forest, so that despite the season the trees kept their evergreen foliage, which provided a nice shade against the sun. Switching between the dirt underneath the trees when I got warm and the asphalt under the sun when I got chilly, I maintained my march for about two hours without seeing another vehicle on the road. By the third hour of my journey, I discovered a path into the woods. With hunting a common sport in the area and the prospect of not reaching a gas station by the end of the day weighing on my mind, the trail held my best chance for help. Stepping into the dark shade of the overarching trees while pine needles crunched beneath my feet, the smell of dirt and pine smothered me. I followed the wide path, figuring it would lead me to a hunter's campsite who might lend me a ride. After playing a few games of kick the pinecone, my hopes were validated. A dirty RV and a black truck rested ahead. With reinvigorated steps, I rushed to the campsite. Hello, I called out to any potential residents. My name is Andrew. My car broke down a few miles down the road. I'm just looking for help. Only bird chirps responded. A thin layer of dirt caked the entirety of the white RV. I approached the large vehicle and gently knocked on the side door. My thumps echoed through the forest, but silence replied. Without much to lose I tried the handle and to my surprise, I discovered the door was unlocked. While I knew I should have waited outside for the respective owners to return, my stomach overruled any rational decision making, and told me I could borrow a few of their snacks and share a laugh about it with the owners later. Hesitating for a moment, I opened the door and stepped inside the RV. I immediately realized the RV wasn't somebody's camper for the weekend. Most of the inside's luxuries were stripped from the vehicle, only leaving its bare metal frame. In the center towards the back, a small stage stood with a video camera, tripod and a laptop sitting by the side. By the stage a few shelves rested with a collection of DVDs in clear, plastic containers. Upon further inspection, the DVDs were store-bought blanks named with handwritten codes. Stranger still were the empty two dog kennels lining the wall with padlocks on their side. As I contemplated my next move, I heard voices outside the RV. 
Though I couldn't distinguish their words, I discerned two separate masculine voices which dominated a smaller feminine voice. Thinking fast I looked to the back corner and found that they hadn't removed the bathroom. I quickly stowed myself behind the door and locked myself in the cramped room. I locked the door and as I pressed my ear against the wall, the voices became distinct as they entered the vehicle. Roughly from memory. I told you Ed when we go out, keep the Gotham RV covered. The first voice chided while a faint crying permeated in the background. We're in the middle of woods, who's going to find us? The second voice replied. Whatever, the first voice resigned. Just get her in the kennel. The cries intensified, but the sound of the metal door closing and a padlock clicking occupied the other voices. We should have a couple hours before anyone realizes she's gone missing, one of the voices, I don't remember which, said. We should do a quick supply run then get the hell out of the state. Agreed, the opposite voice acknowledged. The two continued their banter as they left the RV, leaving me with quieter voice, now sniffling occasionally interrupted with a choking sob. I waited until sound of the truck starting pieced the silent forest before I departed from my hiding place. My eyes met the eyes of a girl no older than twelve locked in a cage like a dog. Her terrified face already told me she didn't trust me and I couldn't blame her. Hey hey, I gently cooed. I'm not one of them. I'm going to get you out of here. I inspected the padlock and quickly realized without a key, I couldn't open it without bolt cutters. What's your name? I asked the girl, now curled into the corner of the cage while I rapidly investigated the RV in hopes of finding a key. The girl never responded, and while I wanted to encourage her to interact, I was on a tight timetable. I went to the front seat of the RV and dug through a half dozen police reports on missing children, though no keys. I opened the glove box and rummaged through its contents to discover, of all things a hammer. Close enough, I figured. While the padlock is made out of solid metal and meant to resist tampering, even with tools the dog kennel was not. I told the girl to stay clear as I struck a corner of the kennel a few times. Weakening with every blow, the girl wrapped her hands around her ears. By the fifth hit though, the cage collapsed on itself. Clearing the metal pieces away from her, I took the girl by the hand who looked up with hopeful, but reddened eyes. Her dirty blonde hair a disheveled mess, visible signs of abuse wrapped around her neck, and on the corner of her mouth. Emma, she spoke finally. My name is Emma. My name is Andrew, I answered, crouching to her level. I don't know what those men did to you, but I promise you're safe with me. Now come on, we have to get out of here. Together we ran through the forest and once we reached the road, we kept ourselves behind the tree line to evade her captors. It took a few hours of hiking, but we finally reached a tiny gas station along the side of the road. With an abused child by side, I didn't need to ask to call for help. The local sheriff came and took our statements. Though our statements matched, he looked at me with distrust. Together we rode to the campsite to find both the RV and truck missing. Only an oil stain and freshly upturned dirt remained where Emma's captors fled. Detained for questioning for the rest of the day, the discovery of my car, much too far for me to have kidnapped Emma in the proper time frame, liberated me. Without looking at their license plate, the sheriff's office issued an amber alert for the description of their vehicles. Emma meanwhile gave a police sketch artist a description of her captors. Her parents declared me a hero and I made the town's front page. While worthy consolidations they never caught the kidnappers. Now old enough to have a loving fiancé who wants to start a family, I can hardly stand the thought of children so long as I know there are people like Emma's kidnappers still in the world. The rolling mountains and densely packed forests of southwest Montana are truly a place where a person could feel alone. Second only to the isolation I experienced in Alaska during my army days. Excluding Yellowstone and Big Sky, this region is sparsely populated, but in the best kind of way. I hadn't had a vacation in at least three years. A real one. I hadn't been counting the weekend trips to Spokane or Cower Deline or Helena. The Montana Highway Patrol had stationed me in Missoula three years ago, right out of field training. I enjoyed Missoula. It kept me busy enough, but I was ready for a break. The schedules finally aligned and I had enough seniority to take off 14 straight days. 
During my time in Mozilla, I had been able to explore Glacier National Park, as well as Flathead and Kootenai National Forests fairly well, so I set my sights on Yellowstone. I hadn't been back to the area since I was kid, 10 years old or so. A family vacation or something. I didn't remember much of it. I had some campsites reserved inside the park itself, but also some in the surrounding Gallatin National Forest. I figured I'd save the money on hotels and just tent instead, since I was saving up to buy a house. I packed all my camping supplies into my truck, as well as my faithful canine companion Tango. Tango was a three-year-old Siberian husky, smart as a whip and with more energy than a nuclear reactor, he was a good companion and the best boy. After about a six-hour drive we arrived at the first campground near Earthquake Lake. I went to my reserved campsite and found that it was occupied. I went and talked with the elderly couple that were the hosts for the campground. They apologized profusely as some glitch in their reservation system had double booked the campsite and I just was too late. There were no other sites in the campground available either. They offered me a full refund and a voucher for a free stay at another campground just down the road. They were positive this campground would have open sites for the next three nights. I thought it was a bit of a long shot since it was peak tourist season. All campsites were booked everywhere. I took the refund and the voucher, figuring I would at least check the place out before I drove to Big Sky to pay $300 per night at a hotel. Howling Woods Campground was the name. It was about a 10 minute drive from the previous site. Nestled in dense lodgepole pines, far off the main highway, the campground was quite beautiful. There was a small river along the southern end of the campground, with a sheer mountain face on the opposite bank. The forest around it was thick and hard to see through. The towering lodgepoles were packed together as densely as I had ever seen them. I'd never heard of this place before. I hadn't come up in any of my Google searches when I was planning my trip months ago. As I was driving into the camp, I first noticed a permanently M-placed RV right at the center. Sitting out front was a sign that read, Welcome to Howling Woods. Please knock. Hosts always on duty. I got out of my truck and followed the sign's instructions. After hearing some shuffling, an extremely elderly woman opened the door. She had skin tanned by a lifetime of working in the sun, and her once jet black hair had more gray in it than black. She squinted at me through weary brown eyes and offered me a toothless smile. I explained my situation and showed her the voucher. Oh, of course, go ahead and pick out a spot, and then come back and check in. I'll get some pamphlets for you. Her accent was Native American. I got back in my truck and found a decent spot. The site was clear and flat, with enough trees between the other sites that I could have some privacy. It was also close to the bathroom and dumpster. A fire ring and a bear box sat in the middle of the small clearing, with a small picnic table just off center. The site was on the outer edge of the loop, so that the back of the site faced the open wilderness. I parked the truck and slapped on Tango's leash. We took a long lazy walk back to the host while I scoped out the other campers. From what I could tell, the campground was about three quarters full, an oddity for this time of year. The sites on both sides of me were occupied. One by a friendly middle-aged couple with Utah plates on their RV and three Maltese ankle biters running circles around it. They waved at me and I chatted with them for a bit. They told me this was their second honeymoon, after all eight of their children had finally moved out. The other site was temporarily home to a couple of twenty-something guys, who didn't look up from their bong when I passed them. The strong skunky smell made me a bit sick as it passed. When I got back to the host, she had me fill out a simple sign-in sheet with my site number, name and license plate. Then she handed me a small pamphlet about local hiking trails, a flyer about bear safety, and a small handwritten note. Intrigued, I opened up the note. In practice cursive script it said. Campground rules. Please extinguish all fires at dusk. Do not leave your tent or camper after dark. If you must leave your tent or camper after dark, do not use any light source. Move quickly and quietly. If you are walking at night and hear something behind you, do not run. Do not look back. Just ignore it. Do not make any loud noises after dark. If you hear anything moving outside of your tent or camper at night, do not look at it. Stay in your shelter. 
howls, barks, grunts and snorts are just local wildlife and nothing to worry about. Ear plugs are provided by the host free of charge. Do not leave any pets outside at night. Lock all doors on your vehicles and campers. Lock your tents if possible. Padlocks can be bought from host. Do not leave the established trails or roads for any reason. Do not ever talk about what you see or hear in this campground. Odd set of rules, I commented. She looked up at me, a flash of anger across her old brown eyes, her wrinkled brow furrowed. Faster than I thought possible she lashed out and wrapped her bony fingers around my first. Follow them, they are important, was the only explanation she offered. There was a seriousness in her eyes I had never seen before in anyone. Then she released her vice grip on my wrist. Okay, definitely. So why is it called the Howling Woods? I've never heard of this place. The wildlife in this forest make a lot of noise at night. It is quite a spectacle. But it is very important never to interact with them. You'll scare them off. Or worse, she explained. I thanked her for her help and set off back to my campsite, shoving the papers in a back pocket. I returned to the campsite, pitched the tent, loaded all the food into the bear box, and started a small fire. I drank a couple Budweiser's and roasted some hot dogs over the open flames. I popped open a book and read a few chapters and drank a few more beers. Dusk snuck up on me pretty fast. I cleaned up the mess and took out my phone to check the weather. I had no cell service, but that certainly wasn't a surprise in this country. I took the beer cans to the nearest dumpster and did my business at the vault toilet. It was just getting dark as I got back to my tent. I chained up Tango while I got the tent ready, turning on my electric lantern. While I was laying out the sleeping bag Tango barked. Tango like most huskies had a personality. He had quirks like a human does. He was a talker and would often howl and talk back to me in that strange husky noise. But he only ever barked when he was scared. I jumped almost through the top of the tent. I grabbed a can of bear spray and a flashlight from my nearby pack and tore out the front flap of the tent. Tango was cowering under the picnic table, visibly shaking. I'd never seen this before. I shined the flashlight around the clearing and saw nothing. Beyond the cone of light the woods were dark. The lodgepole scattered the beam, making it hard to see anything beyond the clearing. I coaxed him out from under the table and ushered him inside the tent. His tail was between his legs and he was shaking. A year ago Tango and I were about six miles deep on a backcountry trail in the Kootenai National Forest. We turned a corner on the trail and came face to face with a grizzly. Tango nearly pulled me face first into the dirt in attempt to run at the bear, utterly fearless and completely oblivious to the size of the bear. Seeing him react in such a way now made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. But I forced myself to think nothing more of it though. I figured the bear had just caught him by surprise and had run off when it heard me coming. I turned off the lantern and settled into my sleeping bag, still a bit unnerved. However, the beers and exhaustion eventually aided sleep in coming fast enough. I wasn't sure how long I had been asleep. When Tango barked again I sat straight up. Every hair on his body was pulled straight up and his eyes were transfixed on the front flap of the tent still come out of my deep sleep state, it took me a second to hear it. The sound of the front flap on the tent being unzipped. In the dark I could barely make out the zipper moving slowly. Gun? Or bear spray? Flashlight? The options raced through a groggy brain. I reached for my duffel bag and drew out my Glock 20 from its holster. I always kept it with me out in the wilderness as a last resort for bear defense. I flicked on the weapon mounted light and shouted, Stop what you are doing, or you will be shot. The zipper stopped moving. I could just vaguely see the silhouette of what looked like a large person crouched on the opposite side of the flap. Tango began to growl this time, posturing for a fight. Then suddenly the silhouette was gone. I could hear something large tear off into the dense brush behind the tent. I barreled out of the flap, gun in hand and Tango right on my heels. I shined the light around the clearing again seeing nothing. Tango stood transfixed and staring at a certain point out in the dark woods. His hackles were still raised and a low growl emerged from his throat. What the f? The chilly wind and frosty mountain air drove me back into the tent quickly. I set my gun back in the pack. My hands were shaking. 
What the F was that? I asked Tango. He started at me, his blue eyes offering no answers. The rest of the night, I laid in my sleeping bag. Sleep would not come to me this time, the adrenaline refusing to leave my system. To make things worse, the howling started. A chorus of bone-chilling howls rose through the night air. They didn't sound like wolf or coyote. I'd never heard anything like it in all the nights I'd spent in the mountains. It went on for hours making sleep impossible. The howls started far off. But eventually it sounded like the sources had moved into the campground. I could hear them coming from different directions, some close to my tent, some far away. One that sounded like it was right behind my tent. Loud, almost ear-splitting. A ghostly, mournful howl. I gripped my pistol tight, waiting for something to happen. But then, it just stopped. It all stopped. Eventually, the light of day began to show through the walls of the tent. I prodded Tango awake, telling him that if I was awake he had to be too. I pulled on some warm clothes and exited the tent. Sitting at my picnic table was the elderly woman that hosted the campground. I jumped back, reaching towards my right hip for a gun that wasn't there out of reflex. In a calm, soft tone she said, You broke the rules. What? You broke the rules. You had your dog out past dark. You used a lantern past dark. You were out of your tent past dark. You didn't lock your tent. Yes yeah, so. Those rules are there for a reason. To keep you from attracting unwanted attention. Attention from what? The creatures of the woods. Something tried to open my tent. No animal can do that. Would you like to buy a padlock? I sighed, yeah sure. She reached into her purse and tossed one to me, five bucks. I fished through the tent until I found my wallet and handed over a five dollar bill. Follow the rules, she stated one more time befitting getting up and walking away. I stood there for a bit, pondering what the last eight hours had entailed. Tango whined at his food bowl and snapped me back into the real world. I took out my griddle and made some eggs and bacon. Tango looked at his bowl of kibble and then at me with his sad eyes. I broke down and scooped some of eggs into his bowl. The marijuana enthusiasts at the next site over were talking about the howls one last night stating that they were, hella freaking sketchy bro. I nodded in agreement to myself. I cleaned up camp and changed into some hiking clothes. I loaded up the dog and the day pack into the truck and went off to find some hiking trails. Exhausted after a day of about 15 miles of hiking, I collapsed into my camp chair. I had about two hours before dusk. Rattled from the night's previous events, I figured I would strictly hold myself to the rules for the rest of my stay. I had considered leaving, but the campground was gorgeous. And free. A hotel nearby would cost $600 or more for a two-night stay. I figured if I followed these rules like the host said, I would be fine. Camp was cleaned and the tent was arranged long before the sunset. Tango and I were bedded down and comfy cozy when dark came. I looped the padlock through the holes in the zippers of the tent flap and locked it. My Glock was sat directly next my sleeping bag, along with a spare mag. I read a few chapters in my book while Tango started snoozing. The howling started around 10 p.m. A cacophony of strange howls almost moans. Twelve full minutes of this. I almost enjoyed them, listening as they get closer, hearing them move around the camp. Wolves or coyotes I assumed. Nothing else could make a noise like that. Tango didn't even seem to perturbed by them tonight. Once they stopped, I snuggled deeper into my bag ready for sleep. A light rain came down, I could hear it splatter off the rain fly on the tent. And then came the worst feeling that could possibly come. I gotta piss. I should have known better. I should have brought an empty bottle into the tent or something. I never thought of it. I looked at Tango sprawled out and snoring. Am I really gonna do this? I asked Tango. He snored in response. I pulled on a hoodie and found my slipped on my slides. Pausing I dig around for the list and double checked. No light got it. The bathroom was a hundred or so yards away if I walked the road. I figured that was the safer option without light. I contemplated taking my gun, but I had no way to carry it. The waistband of my sweatpants wouldn't keep it in place. I opted for the bear spray and shoved it in my pocket. Tango didn't even wake up as I slipped out of the tent. I took the padlock off and then relocated the tent from the outside, 
making sure nothing would bother my buddy. I struggled with leaving him alone in the tent, but the rules said no pets out after dark. I made my way easily enough to the vault toilet and did my business. As I was leaving, the dew-covered dirt handle slipped and the door loudly slammed shut. Shit, I whispered under by breath. Broke another rule. I started my walk back to my tent. I could hear something moving in the dense forest beside me. Ignore it, I kept walking. Then it stopped as soon as it had began. Or at least I thought it did. After a few steps I noticed I could hear soft footsteps behind me. But only when I stepped. My heart started pounding. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. A chill ran down my spine. Ignore it. It seemed like it was timing its own steps to match mine. It purposely was making sure I didn't know it was there. It's stalking me. Ignore it. Follow the rules. Every fiber of my being told me to run. I knew it wouldn't do me much good to run in these slides. I gripped the bear spray tight in my hand. Its steps were getting louder. It was gaining on me. I finally reached the tent. I knelt down to unlock the padlock, fumbling in the dark. I could feel it behind me. My hands were shaking. It was taking forever to enter the combination. It exhaled. I could feel its hot breath on the back of my neck. Ignore it. Finally, the lock popped open. I unzipped the flap just enough for my to squeeze in and shut it quickly behind me. I dove for the gun and quickly pointed it at where I thought it was, careful not to turn on the light. Silence. I reached forward and put the lock back in, struggling to do so with one hand, while the other hand held the gun out in front of me. The lock snapped shut. Silence. Movement. Walking. It was walking away. Trudging through the undergrowth away from the tent. In the pitch black, I didn't see Tango walk up and lick my face. Good boy. Back to sleep. He obeyed, circling his spot three times and collapsing once more. I took a few minutes for the shaking to stop, and then a few more minutes for me to put the gun back down. Sleep came slowly. Not fast enough. I could hear the door of the camper next door open. The Mormons. Well I guess I assumed they were Mormons. They were letting their dogs out by the sound of it. Bad idea. The dogs yipped and yapped. Even wandering over to my sight. I could hear one panting and sniffing a few yards from my tent. The panting and sniffing became barking and growling. The barking and growling turned to yelping and whimpering. Tango shot straight up, eyes fixed at the point in the tent wall where the sound was coming through. I dived at him, wrapping my hand around his snout to keep him from making any noise. SHH boy, be quiet. I could hear movement. The yelping dog was running around my campsite through it. It was getting further away and now it was coming back. Yelping all the way. Then there was a much larger rush of movement and the yelping stopped. The RV door opened and it sounded like the other two dogs scampered up the stairs. Lucy, Lucy, the man called. Bad idea number two. A light slashed through my tent. He must have turned on a flashlight to look for the dog. I could hear him walk down the stairs and start trudging through the undergrowth. Number 3. Eric? Come inside. Lucy will be fine. I'm sure she's just exploring, a female voice called out. His wife. Yeah yeah. He trudged up the stairs and the door closed. I released my grip on Tango and he licked my face again. I couldn't hear anything else moving around. Ignore it. I ignored what I just heard and tried to go back to sleep. It came easier than it should have, and the bliss of slumber washed over me. Morning can fast than it had any right to. I got dressed and took Tango outside. He did his business in the bushes and padded back over to me. I noticed a bit of blood on his front right paw. Awa bud. What happened there? I knelt down and examined his paw. I could find any cuts or sores. Then I noticed he had some on his back paws too. Then it clicked. I stood up and walked over to the spot where Tango had done his business. It was about 10 yards behind my tent in the undergrowth. A smear of blood covered the ground. Blood and white fur. Blood spatter painted the trunks of the lodgepoles surrounding the area. Oh, Lucy. It was still early. The couple in the RV hadn't seemed to have woken up yet. Should I tell them? I would want to know. But the rules say not to talk about it. I decided against it. 
Whatever this place was, I was getting pretty freaked out by it. Just one more night. I hurried up and packed my day pack. I bundled Tango into the truck, and we lit out for a good 14 mile trail that would keep us busy all day. After a day of beautiful mountain meadows, surreal river views, gorgeous lakes and 14 miles of walking Tango and I returned to the campsite. I packed up everything that we wouldn't need for the night into the truck. I noticed the RV at the next site, the couple with the three dogs, well two dogs now I guess was gone. No surprise there. However, the younger gentlemen on the other side of me were still here. Dinner was just a dehydrated hiking meal, since all the good food was packed in the truck. I planned to get out of this place as fast as I could in the morning. Sundown started coming and tango and I got into the tent, locking it behind us. I read a few chapters in my book until it was too dark to make out the words. Sleep came pretty easy tonight. But as is tradition it didn't last very long. Twigs snapping told me someone or something was stumbling around in the underrush next to my tent. I checked my phone and it was around midnight. At least I slept through the howls tonight. I could make out a couple of voices. The young guys from next door. Do you see anything? One of them whispered. Nah, but it's definitely out there, the other said. My mind raced. These idiots were going to get themselves killed. I zipped open a small window on the side of my tent and looked through the screen. They had flashlights out and were tromping around in the underbrush. They looked like they had their phones out in front of them, as if they were recording something. Then it stepped out of the woods into their light. Whether it was man, beast, or a strange combination of both, it was terrifying. I had never felt such utter, visceral fear. Seven or eight feet tall, burning red eyes, a body covered in patchy, greasy fur. Long claws and a protruding snout, fangs and slobber hanging off it. They froze for a second. And then they ran. Back to their tent, diving in. I reached over and grabbed my gun. I had to do something. But by the time I was out of my tent, it had torn into theirs. Blood and viscera flying as it tore into them. Furious. It was odd how silent the savagery was. Maybe I just had auditory exclusion. Who knows? I backed away. Careful not to make any more noise. It got back in my tent and locked it. What else could I have done? They were already dead. I pulled Tango close and kept a white knuckle grip on my Glock. I could hear it now. Slurping and smacking like it was an eight-year-old having spaghetti at an olive garden. Follow the rules. I did my best to sleep that night. When he finally rose I realized it was daytime. Midday almost. I opened my tent to find a cop car blocking my truck in. A deputy sheriff was talking with an author camper, pen and notebook in hand. When I glanced over at the next site, a group of people were loading a body bag into an ambulance. Scanning again, I noticed another deputy walking towards me, stern and grim look on his face. I flashed my badge and he seemed to relax a bit. Hey, you hear anything last night? Follow the rules. No, why? What happened? He gestured towards the body bags. A couple of campers got ate by a bear looks like. You were 50 feet away and you didn't hear anything. Follow the rules. No hard day of hiking and all. We were pretty tired and slept heavy. Sorry. No worries, he sighed. If gave him my name and contact info and he let me go. I packed up the tent as quick as I could and squeezed my truck past the cop car. On my way out, I stopped at the host's site. I knocked, she answered. What the F is this place, I blurted out. She smiled. Someplace ancient, not meant for our kind. But yet, here we are, I hope you enjoyed your stay. Then she shut the door in my face. I stared at the closed door. A tap from the window shocked me out of it. From the window of the camper, she mouthed the words, follow the rules to me. So I did, and I left. Tango and I had a wonderful vacation. But the mountains have never felt the same to me since. The feeling of being watched, being followed, it's always there now. I moved not long after to Salt Lake City. I rarely go camping anymore though Tango and I love our day hikes. I follow the rules. Still to this day. Every time I camp. Surely that's what she meant. This is my story. 
this is in full detail and as much info as I can give. I hope you enjoy it and I hope there are answers. It was election night 2016 and I was lying in bed and about to sleep. I was praying as I usually do every night before I lost faith and I was lying on my side facing the wall. I finished praying and I began to slowly sing under my breath to myself as I occasionally did while going to sleep. While I was singing, I got a feeling like I was being watched, and I heard something from behind me. I turned over to see what it was. When I turned over, I saw something that I just couldn't believe, and I sat up quickly to stay aware. I saw in the middle of my room, squatting by my doorway, a humanoid figure. It had red leathery skin, it was male as it was shirtless and had no breasts and it had no eyes where it should have had eyes. It had these raised ridges of skin vertically up and down its upper face where its eyes should be. It had no ears instead, it had holes like snake ears in the side of its head, and they had these curves like normal ears, but instead it was inverted inside of the head and not out of the head. It had these large hands with black nails like a dog would have, it had huge feet with four toes on each, again with large black nails. It also had no genitals, and instead a scar where the male genitalia should have been, like it had been removed somehow. I was panicking and I pinched myself to make sure I was asleep, and to no avail I didn't wake up. I was looking at the creature, and I noticed it was looking vacantly in front of it, and then it turned and looked at me, and it tilted its head like a dog, and it smiled. I'll also add it did not have lips, so it had a joker-like smile with these odd inhuman-like teeth. It then did something that I still don't understand, it went invisible, as in, it turned invisible, but I could still see the distortion where it was, like the invisibility effect like in Halo or Fallout video games. I could see this distortion slowly begin to move towards me, and I saw the carpeting in the room shift as it walked on top of it, keep this in memory. It got close to the bed and I started to sweat with fear and clutched my blanket with a strong grip. My bed all of a sudden, shifted as if something had sat on top of it, and the blanket started to be pulled by an invisible force. At this point, I began yelling and kicking the air, and it vanished, and I never saw it since. I left the room afterward to do something else because at that point I didn't feel like sleeping. I considered the possibilities of what it could have been because I am naturally a skeptic, and I always look into everything that happens so I can disprove or prove the existence of something. One. I was fully awake and I could move, so it wasn't sleep paralysis. 2. I locked my doors and windows as anyone does in their own home, so it couldn't have been a human entering with a strange costume, unless a door was open etc. 3. This was a long time ago and I think about this moment every day, and I always recall the same details etc. I even wrote this down a year after it happened, so if it was a dream, it would have become vaguer and harder to remember as time went on. 4. The blankets were still where it was when the creature moved them. 5. The carpet still had footprints and imprints from where it, invisibly moved toward me. I know this sounds batched crazy, but this was my experience, and I still wonder what it could have been, I've researched slightly, and I've only told a few about it, so I don't know what it could have been. Hi 9 years ago, I had an unusual experience which I cannot say was either this or that. My husband and I lived in an apartment at the time. I was asleep in the bedroom and he was out in the living room, most likely sleeping on the sofa. I was startled awake by a thunderous knocking at the front door. I was upset because it was about 2 am, and thinking it may have been one of my husband's buddies. I heard my husband get up and answer the door. As he did, something very weird occurred. I felt like I was in a waking dream, losing all consciousness of the time and my surroundings. It's difficult to describe, other than I felt like I was in a bubble, but still able to move about. When I left the bedroom I couldn't locate my husband, but two other people were standing in the living room by the sliding window. One was very tall and lanky, wearing a dark hooded cape. The other was short like the size of a five-year-old, dressed in a black one-piece suit that covered its head. And yet, I had an unmistakable sense that the smaller one was the person in charge of the duo and the situation. I was scared since I thought these two were up to no good and I couldn't understand why my husband had let them in at the same time wondering where he was. I stood still, staring at them and trying to get a better look at their faces. The short one was turned away and it never showed its face. 
but the tall one raised its head and stared right back at me. It looked like a young man with sallow skin but his eyes were solid black. I remember his face was human-like, but that something was just not right. I know there was more, but I simply need to remember further details. The only thing that I recall is waking up late the next morning, walking out into the kitchen, and asking my husband if anyone knocked on the door last night. He said, yes someone knocked, but when I opened the door no one was there. He said he looked outside and into the parking lot. He couldn't figure out how someone could knock and get away so quickly without being seen or heard. He was sure it wasn't a neighbor. He said he had a sick feeling after it happened. I didn't tell him what had happened to me though we have discussed it since then. About two months later, I discovered that I was pregnant. But that was impossible because I was told before we got married that I could not conceive a child. The doctor looked at my tests and scans from a previous examination and determined that my eggs were not viable but he again confirmed that I was pregnant. Calculation of the time when I conceived fell within the period in which we had the strange experience with the two unknown beings. The pregnancy went well and I gave birth to a healthy baby girl. But I have wondered if the encounter had something to do with me being able to conceive a child. Am I being paranoid? This event that I am about to relate to you is the truth, so help me God. It happened in the early spring of 1951 in Korea. We were in the Army Infantry 25th Division, 27th Regiment, 2nd Battalion, Easy Company. We were in what is known on the military maps as the Iron Triangle, near Chorwon. It is night. We are located on the slopes of a mountain, below which there is a Korean village. Previously we have sent our men into this village to warn the populace that we are going to bombard it with artillery. On this night, we were doing just that. We had aerial artillery bursts coming in. We suddenly noticed on our right-hand side what appeared to be a jack-o'-lantern come wafting down across the mountain. At first no one thought anything about it. So we noticed that this thing continued on down to the village to where indeed the artillery air bursts were exploding. It had an orange glow in the beginning. We further noticed that this object was so quick that it could get into the center of an airburst of artillery, and yet remain unharmed. The time element on this I would say, was anywhere from 0.45 minutes to an hour all told. But then this object approached us. And it turned a blue-green brilliant light. It's hard to distinguish the size of it. There's no way to compare it. The light was pulsating. This object approached us. I asked for and received permission from LT. Evans, our company commander at that time, to fire upon this object, which I did with an M1 rifle with armor-piercing bullets, and I did hit it. It must have been metallic because you could hear when the projectile slammed into it. Now why would that bullet damage this craft if the artillery rounds didn't? I don't know unless they had dropped their protective field around them or whatever. But the object went wild and the light was going on and off. It went off completely once briefly, and it was moving erratically from side to side as though it might crash to the ground. Then, a sound we had heard no sound previous to this the sound of like diesel locomotives revving up. That's the way this thing sounded. And then, we were attacked. We were swept by some form of a ray that was emitted in pulses, in waves that you could visually see only when it was aiming directly at you. That is to say, like a searchlight sweeps around, and you would see it coming at you. Now you would feel a burning, tingling sensation all over your body, as though something were penetrating you. So the company commander LT. Evans hauled us into our bunkers. We didn't know what was going to happen. We were scared. These are underground dugouts where you have peepholes to look out to fire at the enemy. So I'm in my bunker with another man. We're peeping out at this thing. It hovered over us for a while, lit up the whole area with its light and then I saw it shoot off at a 45 degree angle, that quick, just there and gone. That quick. And it was as though that was the end of it. But three days later the entire company of men had to be evacuated by ambulance. They had to cut roads in there and haul them out. They were too weak to walk. They had dysentery. Then subsequently when the doctors did see them, they had an extremely high white blood cell count, which the doctors could not account for. Now in the military, especially the army, each day you file a company report. We had a confab about that. Do we file it in the report or not? 
and the consensus was no, because they'd lock every one of us up and think we were crazy. At that time, no such thing as a UFO had ever been heard of, and we didn't know what it was. I still don't know what it was, but I do know that since that time I have had periods of disorientation and memory loss, and I dropped from 180 pounds to 138 pounds after I got back to this country, and I've had great difficulty keeping my weight up. Indeed, I'm retired and disabled today. I figured I would submit my weird experience that I had several years ago. My wife, kids and I were living in government housing and had just moved into a larger apartment across the road from where we were living. We upgraded from a two to three bedroom apartment. I would like to note that the housing where I am from is actually really nicely kept up and is more of an older folks community rather than a slum that housing is notorious for. We loved living there. This was in Chaffee, Missouri which is in southeast Missouri in northern Scott County. We moved in the week of Christmas 2020 or 2021, I can't remember exactly because those years get me confused because we had so much going on, and we only lived there about 18 months before getting a house. So one night the kids were asleep and me and the wife were in bed. She was asleep and I was playing on my phone. The bed was situated so that I could see into the hall from the bed, the end of the bed was across from the door. Note this was around 1.30 am. As I played on my phone I started to see a bright glowing light coming from down the hall, I told my wife I was going to check it out as I thought maybe it was my computer that was in the living room. I got up went down the hall looked around and didn't notice anything out of the ordinary. I went to the bathroom and then got back in bed. In total this took maybe 2 minutes. The apartment was small and you could see everything in just a minute or so. When I got back in bed I got back on my phone and that's when I noticed the time. It was 2.15 am. I had been gone for 45 minutes. My wife was fast asleep and snoring, I woke her up and asked her how long I had been gone, she didn't know and was still half asleep. Looking back at this situation I still cannot explain how I was gone for such a long time without, as I remember the event clearly, and there were no gaps from the time I got up, looked around, went to the bathroom and got back in bed. My boyfriend and I were camping in the woods last summer. It was about midnight and we were still round the campfire talking and drinking. Earlier that day we had seen a car with people drive past our camp so we knew there were others in the close vicinity. Out of nowhere we suddenly heard this gut-wrenching groaning coupled with crying and screams. A man's sobbing got louder and would fade away until we heard crying again, thumping on the ground and all kinds of weird noises. I have never heard anything like it, and this went on for about 5 minutes. I was naturally shitting myself and because we're wild camping, the campsite's owners were about 1 kilometer in a farmhouse. We grabbed a knife and pretty much ran to the car and locked the doors. We texted the owners from the car and they came up to the site. Turns out the group that had driven past us come up every year for a spiritual healing retreat. The guy we heard screaming and crying was getting cleansed. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.